Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks for joining us here for this final session of the inaugural Let Them Talk interview series, discussions about Louisiana and New Orleans music during the French Quarter Festival. Our thanks to the French Quarter Festival and to the New Orleans Jazz Historical National Park, to the uh, Louisiana State Museum, and to the Midlow Center, UNO, Hogan Jazz Archive at Tulane, all helping make these conversations possible. And our, our thanks uh, immediately uh, here to Michelle Lake and Tom McDermott, who are our guests uh, for this final session. We'll be talking a bit, and then they'll be playing. I am holding in my hands, ladies and gentlemen, a copy of the brand new Michelle Lake Tom McDermott duo CD live at Chicky Wawa. Highly recommended. A CD, ladies and gentlemen, so powerful, so compelling, so transformative that when they played it for former Vice President Dick Cheney, he had a complete change of heart. <laughs> From zero to one. <laughs> so uh, these, these are actually uh, on sale at the Louisiana Music Factory, or you can uh, acquire one if you're uh, uh, willing uh, to part with 15 bucks American, a good price at in, uh, you know, for a great CD from Ms. Lake. So uh, the, after the performance, they will be available here, and hope you'll pick one up. Uh, Mashia, where, where are you from? Well, I was born in Southern Oregon in the good year of 1979, and then my family moved to South Dakota when I was eight years old. And I hit the road when I was 17, and I ended up here in New Orleans when I was 20 in the year 2000. What uh, drew you down this way? A traveling circus. A traveling circus. What, what were you performing in it? Yes, I was. What, and what, uh, what was your uh, act? I ate light bulbs and spun fire chains. Um, <laughs> is that a good way to lose weight, eating light bulbs? Uh, yeah, there's not much nutritional value to them, and they're not very good for your teeth, so I wouldn't recommend w was it. Was that like a trick you learned in a pool hall or something? Or? No, it was a trick I learned in the circus. In the circus? Yeah. Uh, how did you begin eating light bulbs? What got you started to <laughs> I was working on another act for a festival in New York. It wasn't quite ready, and uh, the ringmaster called me on stage anyways, and I was like, what am I going to do? And my friend, uh, John Joyce, who now plays bass with the Smoking Time Jazz Club and lives down here and plays music around as well, um, was like, eat a light bulb. And I was, you know, how do I do that? Are you kidding me? He was like, just break it up, wipe off the white stuff, chew it up, and swallow it. And I was like, okay, here goes. And I did it, and that's uh, girls gotta make a living. <laughs> so you don't actually take a bite out of it. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm a lady. I would break them up in bite-sized pieces, <laughs> <laughs> little, little nibbly bites, and yeah. chew them up, swallow it. Now, were were you um, attracted to music uh, as a youngster? Oh, right? absolutely. Um, I was a professional country singer from the ages of nine to thirteen um, in South Dakota. Was was that a family band or? Well, my mama and my aunt both play guitar, and they would have a, a duo, the Lake Sisters, and they would play at the county fair. Um, but I would sing a couple songs with them. I, uh, I won a singing contest. There was this place, Elk Creek Steakhouse and Lounge, that my mom used to take me and my sister to go dancing, and there was a band called the Wilt Brothers Band. Um, one night we went there and they had a singing contest, and it was all adults, and it was this big deal. And I was like, I want to do it, because I would always sing around the house, and I was uh, quite the show off as a youngster. And they were, uh, oh, cute, the little girl wants to be in the, in the contest. We'll wave the entry fee. And I was like, all right, thanks. And I got there and sang uh, Patsy Cline's Walking After Midnight, and I won <laughs> the contest. <laughs> and uh, I won $500 and a regular gig. And that, be that began the uh, country band career. Yes, yes, I did. What, uh, singing was something that you enjoyed uh, immensely then. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, incredibly. I mean, it feeds my soul and keeps me sane. You know? I mean, music is just, it's a salve, you know, and it's something that I, I, I need to do to be okay, you know. Were, were you listening to, uh, obviously, some, some country music, but other kinds yeah. of music as well? Um, well, back then I was listening to what my parents listened to, you know, I was, I was a little kid. But then when I, when I was 13, you know, 
the hormones start to go, you start to get explorative, and I was like, country music isn't cool anymore. And I started listening to uh, um, like a lot of punk rock music and, um, and Bauhaus and started getting interested in more kind of rebellious forms of art, like 1930s surrealism and things like that, kind of spreading my wings that way. And then time progressed, and I've, I've gotten into everything from classical music to opera, back into country music, and of course jazz. And yeah. Tom, uh, what about you? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, born, in, born there in 57. Uh, my mother was a pianist, and her sister, uh, my <coughs> Aunt Rita, was my teacher. Musical family, all of our... I had five siblings and everybody played a little bit and uh, two of them grew up to be one's a full-time vocal teacher at Delgado and another is a weekend warrior musician in uh, Albuquerque very fine string player um, so my mother played ragtime things like novelty rags like Kitten on the Keys and Dizzy Fingers so I, I was playing that stuff pretty young I would say by the time I was 11 or 12 I, I could play pretty well and um, then the Joplin revival hit and uh, a little before the sting I got into Joplin sting came and then the St. Louis was uh, the cradle of ragtime it's the first big city that had that, that you know fostered it it wasn't necessarily all created there, but that's where people seemed to congregate to swap ideas. And it was the fourth biggest city in the country at one time. So a lot of, you know, musicians from the Mississippi Valley and all that came to St. Louis if they didn't go to Chicago. So I had, uh, you know, good fortune of getting turned on to that. There was a radio show uh, on the NPR station called Ragophile and so by the time I was 13 or 14 I was able to hear Jelly Roll Morton and Fat Swaller and Yubi Blake and that was all really exciting for me uh, so I eventually got into trad jazz uh, traditional jazz and you know slowly learned how to improvise I didn't go to jazz school so in a way I've never had an orthodox way of learning improvisation but in fact you really teach yourself as a jazz musician so um, around the time around the early 80s I discovered first Dr. John and then Professor Longhair and then finally James Booker who really sent me over the edge um, I just really became wildly in love with his music and was able to come down here once to hear him before he uh, passed away. But he died in 83. I didn't move here till 84. I took, you know, I just took me a few visits, a few times dipping my toes in the water before I knew I wanted to live here and kind of took the collapse of my life in St. Louis for that to happen too. I lost my job, I lost a girlfriend, and just all signs pointed to New Orleans. I got a, a improbable gig at the World's Fair, which was, you know, pretty hard for an out-of-towner to do. But I had a good, good connection. So it was just uh, seemed karmic that I would end up here. And actually, today is the 28th anniversary of my leaving St. Louis for New Orleans. All right, very good. Well, you certainly. Uh, Done, done great work and uh, continue to develop uh, as a as a performer and a musician here. Well, I've taken advantage of the myriad styles here from Gottschalk to funk. And uh, I'm one of these lucky people who likes it all. Um, can't necessarily play it all, but I like it all, you know. I find there are musicians who just love traditional jazz or just love funk or just love R&B and you know I'm not one of those I, I I I just like it all you find something to uh, 
inform you and to, uh, to touch you and, and all of those things. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of it is the, the piano playing that runs through it. You know, Gottschalk is great and Henry Butler is great. So there's plenty of plenty of ore to, to mine in all of that music. Yeah, and the more you hear it and the more you learn about it, the more connections between all these things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I could play you a piece of Gottschalk that sounds like Henry Butler to me in a way, in a weird way. You know, it's very, you know, something written in the 1850s. The, the roots here are so deep that I mean, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never finish digging. It's just always more to learn. Yeah, the, the horizon keeps receding as you find out more. There's more to find out. Yeah, and what is it the the man the man who looks can look farthest in the past can see the furthest in the future. Is that right? Is that grammatical? Well, you know what I mean. Yeah, we're gonna print that <laughs> anyway. Good, yeah. it's, on, it's going on the T-shirt, <laughs> on the bumper sticker. Right? Yes. What well, was a piano your your first instrument? Yeah, and only. Yeah. I mean, I've dabbled with accordion. And um, darn it, I've even tried to pick up the guitar as recently as this year, and I just can't get the hang of it. I would really love to play the guitar, but it's not the simplest thing to learn. No, it's it's I just just can't do it. It's it's very weird. I I broke my wrist in September, so maybe when that is absolutely one hundred percent healed, I'll try again. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, there's uh, st still plenty of time. We hope. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, you plenty lived here to learn on the life. piano, too, yeah. for right. God's sake. Right, yeah, there was no end to what you can, can uh, you know, what you can learn there. Oh, no. Keep pursuing it. Uh, what about writing music, Tom? Was that uh, something you did fairly early in life? It is. I, well, you know, not by, uh, you know, Mendelssohn or Mozart's Mozartian standard. levels, but, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think I did the typical composer thing, started writing when I was uh, maybe 18 or 19. I put out an album of rags, original rags. It's my first LP when I was around 21 or 22. And I pray that you never hear it. <laughs> but uh, there's still a couple pieces. Uh, on that album that I play, and one of them I just recorded for the Treme series, even so. You know, yeah. I, yeah, I can say I can say yeah, this is a piece I wrote 32 years ago. You know. Right. Well, you've uh, I know you've written a lot of things. Um, uh, maybe doing doing even more writing here in recent years. Yeah. Well. I mean, I guess I'm prolific by New Orleans standards because New Orleans is not really a writing town, especially. It's a, it's a groove town, right. you know, and it's a blues town, but uh, not, uh, yeah, and I have, you know, I grew up with Chopin, so I write, I love writing French false musettes. Mm -hmm. I, um, the year I moved here, I got introduced to Brazilian music in 84 in the form of a fantastic composer named Ernesto Nazare. And uh, that has propelled me to uh, 14 visits to Brazil, recorded an album down there. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's a weird, they have their own cousins to our type of music. Their, their trad jazz cousin is Choro. And I've really uh, made a point of digging into that. Yeah, it's great, great music, and uh, you've written some nice things in that uh, in that you. style. Thank you. Um, what about uh, was that a solo gig that you had first at the uh, World's Fair? It was. I think I did it, you know, thirteen or fourteen times before the money ran out. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the fair, but it started out big, and then by June, June, July, <clears throat> they started really cutting back because nobody was coming or not enough people were coming. But it was a great fair, I thought. What was your first band experience uh, in New Orleans? I played with the late Jacques Goutet a little bit as a sub, but my first full-time band gig was with the Dukes of Dixieland, who I joined in 1990. And I can say that one of the few people 
I think can say this, that the first band I joined full-time actually played Carnegie Hall. So, yeah. you know, I stayed with them off and on for about eight years um, with a couple sabbaticals. And that was a very good experience for me. Um, you know, the repertory got a little repetitive. It got very repetitive <laughs> towards the end, but it was good for me to play, you know, solo pianists, don't always have the best sense of time. So to play with a steady drummer, in this case, Dickie Taylor, was, uh, was valuable. You know, it really, my time is still not, you know, Henry Butler level, but, you know, it's a lot better than it was in 1990. Yeah. So. Mashita, when did you start doing music uh, in New Orleans? Um, about 2003 but just uh, around campfires and backyards. Uh -huh. um, but that's when I really started to learn New Orleans music. Um, and I started doing it professionally in 2007. So uh, after a few years of just kind of uh, getting with whoever you could and, and having fun doing things, you, you began to? Yeah, I mean, it was this unattainable dream to me, like something that I always loved and always wanted to do, but didn't really know how to go about learning the language or how to go about starting off. And then, thank you, universe, it just kinda, kinda happened, you know. Yeah. Well, in 2007, what kind of uh, gigs were you working? I was playing on the street mostly with a band called The Loose Marbles. Hmm. And uh, we would set up on Royal Street about five times a day, or five times a week. So it was a, it was a job, you know. Right. But I was, I was in heaven. I was getting, getting to sing and learning learning the language of music and learning how to uh, really collaborate with other musicians and, and listen. Listening is so important when you're working with somebody. You know. yeah. What kind of tunes would the Loose Marbles do? Traditional jazz, Up a Lazy River, you know, Louis Armstrong. That, that's how I started learning the, all the old standards and it just kind of, I just didn't stop. I mean, like Tom said, once you start digging, like, right just keeps getting bigger and that's part of the beauty of it like I'm uh, I don't know if it's a short attention span or a wanderlust but I tried my hand at many different things um, all of them artistic and sometimes tend to lose interest in it but music is so vast and so multi-layered that it's it's infinite in a way and uh, I also have a love for the visual arts I was a, a painter as a teenager and had full plans on going to art school but took a year off to travel and yeah never stopped. Um, but with music you can incorporate uh, poetry with the lyricism and uh, visual art with the cover art and it's, it's beautiful. It encompasses kind of all artistic forms. Uh, when did you two first meet? Do y'all recall it? Eight? Yeah. It was, well, I, I heard her singing with the Marbles and I was very taken by that band and the whole scene of what is might, you might call the Frenchman Street scene now, but um, all these young young kids now, you know, 20, 30 years younger than me playing the music I really loved. And uh, that the marbles at that time were, I thought, were very strong. They had a, a trumpet player in Ben Polson, who's the son of a fine cornet player, Ed Pulser. They had a very quirky, very quirky clarinet player who I liked a lot. Um, and they had an accordion player named Patrick Harrison who was an absolute monster player. Uh, and they had Mashiach. And I just really, they, they, and they had enthusiasm. And they were young, you know. I had been playing trad jazz for 25 years by then with a lot of guys who had kind of lost the spark maybe so it was it was great seeing this youthful energy and uh, I got them a couple gigs um, at Donna's where I played piano you know I couldn't play with them in the street although they did have a we piano did, out there for a while a piano. for a while piano with yeah <laughs> but I but I didn't do much I don't really know if I ever did that with y'all but um, I got, I remember doing a couple Donna's gigs and then the marbles kind of disintegrated, but
but I just you know remembered how much I like Mashia and I I said let's let's do some uh, gigs. I guess we did a uh, maybe we did Snug Harbor a couple times before uh, before the regular Chicky. Oh oh and Donuts. Donuts. That's every right. Thursday. Not every Thursday, but we did a few. Yeah, <laughs> we did a few. I, I what maybe a half dozen something like oh, that. Oh, more than that. In my mind, it was a regular gig. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, and you're not even married. <laughs> <laughs> You have you have more brain cells than I do, so I'm <laughs> um, But then, then eventually, uh, I don't know how we got the Chicky Wawa gig, but it's been going strong for two years. Yeah, and uh, Dale Trigero is just a huge fan of, of of this duet, and he he paid to put out this album, and you know we're we're thrilled. I think we came, we got. John Porter to produce it. He's a big shot, you know. Bonnie Raitt and Taj Mahal and BB King and all these, you know. What? Eric Clapton. Yeah, he's he's, you know, hobnobs with all these people, and he he did a really good job. So we're just delighted that, and I'm delighted not to put out money for another CD. <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> because right. they they, it takes years and years and years to Sorry, make your money back. Yeah. So. So return on investment, uh, maybe not that great, but uh, you had the opportunity. You have put out some really great records, so you have that. Well, yeah, and uh, it's paying off now because you know tracks are getting picked for Treme, yeah, and, so, and uh, actually Van Dyke Parks is putting out a Best of oh. McDermott CD. Oh, that's wonderful. This summer, yeah, right. and you know once again I won't make money from CD sales per se but that'll lead to placements in movies and TV and I such. imagine because he knows everybody in Hollywood uh, well you two just have such a beautiful rapport as together as a, as performers it's, okay. it's really a, a, a treat to hear you um, could you feel that right away that playing together <laughs> I, I don't know, I just, I have very quirky time. I'll throw in lots of odd accents and jagged basses and all that, so I need a singer who's not phased by that type of thing, and she isn't, she just, it was, she, she it, keep, yeah. it was hard for me at first, oh, okay. but because of like listening is such an important part of collaboration, I would just kind of, kind of like dancing, you uh, uh, keep a, Keep your feet on the ground, but also be pliant at the same time, like a tree in the breeze. So that's just what I did in the beginning. Then eventually you play with somebody and you, you get to know what, what to expect from them. Yeah, he still, weird, keep, he still keeps me on my toes, but yeah. like it's, it's, it's easier to be that tree in the breeze now. Uh, what about the repertoire? Was, uh, I mean, what type, kind of things do you all typically do um, in, a, uh, in a set? Well, I pretty much have bended to what Mashia already knew, but I've introduced you to a couple of new things. Yeah, we do this very modern tune from the 1960s. That's <laughs> <laughs> All the way into the 60s. Yeah, yeah but, but usually things are from the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Was that your natural uh, inclination, Mashia? Yeah, actually, it just uh, the stars just aligned. Ever since I was young, I always was attracted to things of that era, like surrealism from the 1930s and right. the fashion of the era like the 1910s to the 40s, per se. I was just just always attracted to it and always had a feeling about New Orleans as well. And then when I came down here, and just I saw the fire and the gas lamps, and I was like, I'm home. <laughs> Horse carriages everywhere, and then the, the music down here too, especially traditional music. I got very taken with Mashia, Mashia's style, because she's not a typical jazz singer. I mean, I would not even say jazz is the main thing she, that she does. She's she loves the old blues. I mean, Bessie Smith, who I uh, adore, yeah. and she has this strong country thing in her singing. So, I, girl out of South Dakota. yeah. So we, you know, we've done a couple Hank Williams tunes. Actually, there's there's so much more we can do, and I hope we do get to explore in the future. But for now, we're just covering the basics and uh, 
It's just a lot of fun because, in fact, uh, I don't like most jazz singers, I would say. Uh, I mean, I like the great ones, but it's not my idea of a good time listening to a, a female jazz singer, typically, because it, it just, it, I don't know. Oftentimes they're emulating somebody else. And not to talk trash about anybody, you know, I mean, that's, that's how you learn, by emulation, you know. And, of course, Billie Holiday is highly influential to me yeah. and to a lot of other people. But um, a lot of times, the school musicians like have so much in technique that they kind of don't let themselves go into where the music is going. And a lot of the guys that I play with in my little big horns have master's degrees and went to school for music, and they came down to New Orleans and had to forget everything that they learned. <laughs> They're like, oh man, I wasted thousands of dollars. Like I could just come down here and started playing and learned, you know. Yeah. Well, that was uh, uh, Lester Young's great one of his several great lines was, uh, "I hear the notes, but where's the story?" Yeah, yeah. You need huh? you need both. My ultimate goal is to become, I mean, a, a master technically and learn the language through and through, um, but never to lose sight of that genuinity, you know, and the the base of it, the gut of it. And to do something with passion and expertise is the best of, exactly. uh, of uh, those worlds. That is the ultimate. And that's something these folks do. Would you like to hear a couple of tunes, yeah. ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Tom McDermott, we'll see you later.
to my lover's heart for me. kissing her now. So I believe it's the only waltz that we currently do.
sing a gospel tune, which I still have not memorized the changes on, so uh, I'm just being cautious here. And uh, this is a song called I'm Gonna Live the Life I Sing About in My Song. You got it! Yes. And uh, you can go on uh, YouTube and see Marion Williams' performance, which was the one which inspired Mashia to. She's like a lioness, it's incredible. To do this. We both have our cheat sheets on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Always stumble around If I'm in a crowd If I'm alone On the street Or in my home I gotta live the life I sing about yeah, In my soul Every day Every way On that busy Third row thing Both may watch me some may mock me, say I'm a fool, but I don't care. I can live one thing and sing another, be a saint by day and a devil under cover. I gotta live the life I sing about yeah, in my soul. This year at the French Quarter Festival, it's been great. A particular thanks to Danny Kadar, who's done such a great job of doing the technical side of things here and making it so easy for us to do this. Thanks, Danny. Thanks to all of you for being here. Look forward to seeing you here next year. Thank you.